This problem involves a generator whose output is connected to a transformer whose output is connected to a resistor. First, we'll talk about the characteristics of the generator. A coil with 20 turns is placed in a magnetic field whose strength is 0.1 tesla. The radius of the coil is 0.15 meters and it turns with a frequency of 60 hertz. This device is called a generator and produces an AC voltage. The output of the generator is fed into a transformer that has 100 turns on the input side and 400 turns on the output side. Finally, the output of the transistor is attached to a 15 ohm resistor. In order to understand the solution of this problem, we're going to have to learn about generators transformers and resistors. The last of these, the resistor, I'm going to assume we're familiar with and so we understand that V equals IR for any resistor. However, we're going to take a moment out to perform a diversion in which we consider generators and transformers so as to deduce the appropriate equations that we'll need to solve the rest of the problem. Both generators and transformers use Faraday's law as written for coils. Because a coil is in fact n loops in series, we get n times the voltage from any single loop, which is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Any flux is always field times area, and in the case of a constant field, can be written in the form field vector dotted with area vector. The dot product can always be written as the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle in between. You can see from this formula the three kinds of Faraday's law problems. Those that vary the field, those that vary the area, and finally those that vary the orientation between the field and the area by rotating a loop such as in a generator. If we assume that the loop is moved with a constant angular velocity, then we can simply replace the theta by omega t. It's then a simple matter to deduce the voltage on the coil by taking negative n times the time derivative of the previous expression. B and A are constants. The derivative of cosine is sine with of course a negative and the derivative of the interior by the chain rule is omega. This result can be written in its easiest to remember form as omega n B A times the sine of omega t. What this formula means is that the voltage on the coil oscillates back and forth as the sine function goes from plus one to minus one. That means that the largest voltage we ever see is positive omega NBA and the smallest voltage we ever see is negative omega NBA. For this reason, we recognize that the voltage on the coil has a peak value of omega NBA. In general, all AC terms can be expressed either as a peak value or some form of average. Because sine goes between plus and minus one, the actual average voltage is zero, which does not tell us the information we wish to have. Instead, we have a mildly fancier method of performing the average. And this is to determine the RMS or root mean square value. Root mean square is very literal in that it means we take the square root of the average or mean of some quantity squared. In this case, the quantity that we'll be taking the average of is the voltage on the coil. The constants omega n, b, and a will be squared and then square rooted because they come out of the average. And our expression will simply require that we find the square root of the average value of the sine squared function. Sine squared has a smallest value of zero, has a largest value of one, and in fact the average value of sine squared is one half. Therefore, we conclude that the RMS voltage of the coil is equal to the peak voltage on the coil divided by the square root of two. This formula between RMS and peak does not just apply to the voltage on a coil in a generator, but in fact applies to any oscillating quantity. The peak is always larger, and so we divide that one by square root of two in order to learn the RMS. Finally, we need to also understand transformers. In the case of transformers, we will have two coils that obey Faraday's law. 
And so we will write Faraday's law twice, once for what we call the input side and a second time for what we call the output side. The key to making two coils into a transformer is that the two coils will share the same magnetic field by being wound around each other. So therefore, even though every other term V and N in these equations has a subscript to decide whether it represents the in or the output side. The deflux dt is the same and therefore we can perform a division to find that the ratio of the voltages is the same as the ratio of the number of turns in the coils on the in and out side. These expressions can be collected together and will allow us to solve the rest of the problem at hand. Collected together on the original slide, we summarize that V peak is an easy formula to remember by basketball fans, omega NBA. V RMS is always smaller than V peak by a factor of square root 2. And for transformers, the ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the number of turns. This formula, as well as Ohm's law for resistors, is true both in the format of peak and in the format of RMS you simply need to be consistent in that all terms should either be peak or all terms should be RMS before you perform the numerical calculations. And now we're finally set to begin the numerous calculations. The peak voltage of the generator will be omega which is 2 pi frequency times number of turns magnetic field and area. The N here of course refers to the coil inside the generator and hence has the value 20. The magnetic field is 0 0.1 and the area for a circular loop is pi times the radius squared. Plugging in the numbers we will find that the peak voltage of the generator is equal to 53.30 volts. In this and all subsequent calculations in the problem, on my calculator I kept all the digits, but I truncated them to about four places when copying them to the screen. In part B of the problem we're asked for the RMS voltage produced by the generator and we always remember that RMS voltages are smaller than peak voltages and therefore we'll need to take our peak result and divide it by the square root of 2. This gives us the numerical value of 37.68 volts. Next, we'll need to deal with the transformer. As stated previously, the transformer has an input and an output voltage, and both of these can be expressed in either peak or RMS form. We simply need to use our transformer equation consistently. Solving for the quantity we want, which is the output voltage in peak form, we get this expression. The output number of turns was 400, the input number of turns was 100, and because we wish to determine the peak quantity for the output, we put in the peak voltage on the input, and this yields the result 213.18 volts. Part D involves a very similar calculation, except in this case, we're asked to find the RMS output voltage of the transformer. We have two possibilities, both of which will give us the same result. One is to take the previous answer and divide by square root of 2, and the other is to take the previous formula and use as our input the RMS generator voltage rather than the RMS peak voltage. No matter which way we go, we're going to get the same result for the RMS output voltage of our transformer and that result is 150.74 volts. Having finished calculating both peak and RMS values as they come out of the generator, we are now going to find peak and RMS currents through the resistor, and for that calculation we're going to use V equals IR. Solving for the current I and recognizing that Ohm's law works as long as we have consistent notation, we set the peak current equal to the peak voltage over resistance. Because the voltage outputted from the transformer is the one applied to the resistor, we're going to use the 213.18 volts divided by 15 ohms to get a result of 14.21 amps. At the risk of seeming redundant, we recognize that the next calculation, having learned I as a peak value, is to determine I as an RMS value. RMS values are always smaller than peak values, 
and therefore we divide the peak value by square root of 2 to yield the result 10.05 amperes. The final two calculations are going to involve considering the power dissipated, and the power dissipated in this circuit is dissipated by a resistor. Let's take a moment to consider the process by which power is dissipated. Power at any given instant is equal to the voltage at that instant times the current. Going back to the formulas that include an oscillator, we will find that V peak times sine of omega t should be multiplied by current peak also times sine of omega t. At this point, we make a note of caution. The voltage and current are assumed here to have the same trig function applied to them because they are assumed to be in phase. This does apply to the resistor in this problem, but it does not apply to either a capacitor or an inductor. Please be aware of the distinction for those two devices where they actually don't dissipate power at all. Going back to the formula at hand, let us average on the left and right hand side of the equal sign. On the right hand side, the two constants V peak and I peak will come out. And then once again, we will have an average of a trig function squared. And the average value of sine squared is once again 1 half. For convenience, we can break the 1 half into two pieces. Square root of 2 underneath of V peak and square root of 2 underneath of I peak that will give us VRMS times I. RMS. Plugging in the values that apply to this problem, we will find that the average power dissipated by the resistor is 1514.9 watts. Finally, to complete the problem, a rather bizarre question is presented to us. And that question is, what is the average torque required to keep the loop spinning? This part of the problem is simply a reminder of something that is quite true. Energy is never for free. The fact that you are dissipating power in the resistor means that you must have input energy into the system somewhere, and that input is the torque required to spin this loop, which is not negligible at all. To derive the relationship involving torque, let's go back to the meaning of power, and power is energy or work per unit time. In the case of linear motion, work was force times distance, and so the power could be written as force times velocity. It is most often true, and certainly true here, that in order to get the rotational formula, one simply looks at the linear formula and replaces all the terms. The rotational equivalent of force is a torque, and the rotational equivalent velocity is omega. Therefore, we're able to say that our 1514.9 watts were generated by applying a torque with an omega of 2 pi frequency, where in our case the frequency was 60 hertz. This leaves the only unknown in our equation as the torque, and the result of the calculation is that the torque is 4.018, and of course is in the units of Newton meters. And that completes our detailed analysis and derivation of a generator, transformer, driving a resistor.